Bueno. Graham Spider Webb was born on April 19th, 1936 in the town of Parramatta. He is one of the most prominent Australian radio and television broadcasters and a prolific producer. Graham began his radio career at 2TM in Tamworth in 1954. In 1955, he moved to Brisbane to become a junior announcer for 4BH before moving to 4GY Gimpy to gain more experience. After a stint in the National Service, Graham returned to Sydney in 1956 where he became the announcer for the Sunday religious programs on Radio 2CH. Consequently, Graham became Reg Grundy's offsider to the radio version of Wheel of Fortune. In early 1957, Graham moved to Radio 2KY, working alongside Lyle Richardson, one of Australia's first disc jockeys. Lyle became Graham's mentor, and Graham found himself many times filling in for Lyle's radio show, The Toast of the Town, broadcasting live from Checkers Nightclub in Sydney. In late 1957, Graham joined Radio 2UE, where he hosted the world's first Top 40 radio program, which evolved on March the 5th, 1958, working alongside Gary O'Callaghan, John Laws, Johnny Withers, and Bob Rogers, a format the entire world would follow. So immensely popular was Graham, the legendary impresario Lee Gordon recognized his talent and invited Graham to do on-stage and off-stage introductions to all the legendary performers appearing at the Sydney Stadium. Between 1957 and 1963, Graham was introducing and befriending Buddy Holly, Paul Anker, Chubby Checker, Johnny O'Keefe, Bobby Rydell, Bobby V, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, B.B. King, The Rolling Stones, Shirley Bassey, Johnny Mathis, Cole Joy and the Joy Boys, The Unforgettable Deltones, Nat King Cole, Marty Robbins, Guy Mitchell, The Platters, Sammy Davis Jr., Walt Disney's Mouseketeers, and Frank Sinatra. In 1958, in the earliest days of television, through the efforts of Lyle Richardson, Graham was featuring on Channel 9's Wide World of Sports, interviewing a sportsman of the week, greats like Lou Hode and Ken Rosewell. By 1961, Graham was working for Radio 2GB, doing all the important breakfast shifts. In 1964, Graham headed for Europe, where he worked at several radio stations, eventually moving to England, where he, along with several other Australian DJs, became prominent in the flourishing pirate radio scene. Graham joined Radio Caroline in 1965, going on to become program director and later news director. Riding at Angoro Carriage and safely outside the three mile limit, the innocent looking experiment Caroline is causing quite a stir in official circles. She's a floating broadcasting station, hoping to make a big thing out of commercial radio and waiting for the advertisements to roll in. Radio Caroline, believe it or not, this is the broadcasting station of Flint. The pirate station in the North Sea, just comfortably anchored in international waters, three and a half miles off Flint. The eight disc jockeys work a week's stint out here, and then get a week's holiday. There's just a 10 kilowatt transmitter pumping the music out, but millions of kids have learned to say, I love Caroline on 199, and they lap it up from six in the morning until eight o'clock at night. The disc jockeys have got themselves fan clubs out of the job that the postmaster general is trying to stop. What did you think? I am coming up to chat with Radio. Would you like to see more? Yes! Alright. We're going to see part two now. Alright. Why not? Maybe five of them. Australian succeed as disc jockeys all over the world. And we have with us a panel of Australian DJs who've made it overseas. Graham Webb, who was with the famous Radio Caroline in, in uh, England. Uh, next to him, yes, give him a round of applause. Graham, your, your thing with Britain was really incredible. That's in the days before commercial radio was allowed, and you were one of the people bobbing around in that boat called Radio Caroline. January 1966, 10 years ago, at Caroline Radio Ground. That was in the mid 
and the middle of my street, and one year on board. You were on the air at the time of underground. The ship just sort of cut off the drift, did it? it? Well, actually, because it had been sitting there for like three years, it was revolving around on its anchor chain, and it just snapped, and we started drifting ashore. We were broadcasting sort of the time, but most everybody, except the DJ who was on air, everybody was in the mess hall, uh, just eating dinner, watching television, watching our TV there. And we didn't know we were adrift. There was nobody on radio watch and nobody on uh, visual watch of uh, the crew I'm talking about. And we saw a message flashed up on the screen that said, Caroline, you're adrift <laughs> on, on British commercial television. Because the Coast Guard had been trying to get through to us, and then uh, the, obviously the captain didn't know about it. But there was feverish activity below trying to get the engine started, which hadn't been going for like 18 months. And there was no way of getting the thing started, so we just drifted further and further to shore. I climbed right up on top here. Uh, Hold it up, Brad. I'll, I'll, I'll show it That's the old ship. Terrible that, old ship. That is Caroline, 470 tons monster. And up on top here, I climbed uh, and, and watched. The, the shore come closer, with the ship sort of passing around underneath me, and that was frightening. And there was snow and wind and rain, and ah, oh, it was the most yucky night you could ever have a false nine gale. And we ended up 50 feet from the shore. There is a photograph of it here on, on, where is it, um, uh, on shore, where it ran aground. This little one up here, if you can find it at all, this little one here is where it was ashore. And you can see it's really hard aground. We were 50 feet from the uh, breakwater, 50 feet from these wartime pylons that were in the ground, and 50 feet from the actual shore. And uh, that was a frightening, frightening night. I'll bet it was. Because the whole thing is Australians have carried commercial radio, as we know, to all parts of the world. Returning to Australia late in 1966, Graham hosted several television shows, including the groundbreaking and iconic Blind Date, which ran for several years between 1967 and 1970. In the early 70s, Graham was once again introducing great stars at the Chevron Hotel. Stars like Rowan and Martin, Tom Jones, Johnny Ray, Wayne and Newton, Bobby Darren, and Winifred Atwell. At this stage, Graham was flying high and he had the golden touch. He then hosted the classic quiz show Jeopardy between 1971 and 72, and then became the voice announcer at Channel 7 in 1973. While working as a booth announcer, he envisaged an amazing concept for a new television show. On January 27, 1974, long before Countdown, Graham hosted and produced a pioneering Saturday morning music video series called The Graham Webb Saturday Show. So popular was this show, grabbing more than 65% of the ratings, Channel 7 ordered Graham to produce another pop program to be screened five days a week. Calling the show Scene at Five, it premiered to top ratings starting on April the 5th, 1974. By the end of the year, all other stations were trying to copy what Graham had created, a pop revolution. As the producer and star, Graham played an important part in the career of video and feature film producer, Russell Mulcahy. In need of material for his shows, Graham often approached Russell, who was a staffer at the ATN7 newsroom, and asked him to produce some film footage to accompany popular songs. Most songs in those days had no official film clip. Using this method, Graham and Russell assembled a catalog of film clips. The success of his early efforts encouraged Russell to quit his television job and to become a full-time director. He made clips for the popular Australian acts Marsha Hines, Hush, and ACDC. With the big date of colour television transmission starting on March the 1st, 1975, the Graham Web Saturday show became sound and limited. Accepted as the world's first program to feature pop video clips, featuring a young and up-and-coming star, Donnie Sutherland. Whilst television took all Graham's time, he also had a hand in radio throughout the 1970s and 80s, working at several stations, including 2GB and 2UW in Sydney. Graham also had a popular dance show, which he toured around the big clubs. Graham even opened up his own nightclub called Hill Street in Hurstville, attracting many celebrities. In the early 1990s, Graham relocated to the Gold Coast, where he was heard on Gold FM and the ABC. After his wife Tina died from cancer in 1995, Graham and his two sons relocated to the Sunshine Coast. However, more tragedy was lying just around the corner. 
Graham Webb's high-flying career in radio and television earned him enough to make life more than comfortable. But now he's been forced to take up a whole new career as an undertaker of all things to try to regain some financial security for his children. It was the late 60s and early 70s and the world was truly Graham Webb's oyster. There was the first Mercedes and the highlight of the famous. And he laid, is in my head, and in my Success followed success with a series of TV and radio shows, including the world's very first pop clip program, Sounds Unlimited. We created what is called the 80s phenomenon. The first pop clip about it in rock video. Well, they mentioned me in there. But to the astonishment of many who know him, Graham Webb, multimedia star, is now an undertaker. This is the last profession I would have thought I'd ever be getting into, but I guess it, uh, uh, it is fate, isn't it? How that fate befell him is a sad and sorry tale of deception involving this pair of chits. Graham's two young boys, Jared and Corey, are his world. Since the tragic death four years ago from cancer of his wife, Tina, he's been their mother as well. It's a bit difficult for him at the moment because of all this working with the funeral business, but I just didn't get through it. Everything Graham had worked for all his life was put at risk when Stephen Browning and his partner, Dame Claire Burke-Jones, broke into Graham Webb's life. Well, I'm doing a movie, uh, they come and talk to you about it. So they came over to tell me about this movie called Absolute Nightmare. And uh, that's what my life turned into since then. Uh, 10 days later, they'd moved in to Graham's home on the Gold Coast. I was horrified. Kay Barkley has been a friend of Webb's for 40 years. She feared that Browning and Dame Claire could take advantage of his nature. As Graham takes in three dogs, cats, kids, his Graham would take in anyone. Browning still hadn't found the finance for his film. And when he discovered that Graham's house was unencumbered, he made a suggestion. So he said, well, what about we go ahead and do a, a, a project that's going to uh, give us some short-term cash flow? And that was to be the, the funeral business. So I said, I, I don't want anything to do with it. Graham had discovered that instead of a third of his house being mortgaged to the business, the whole house had been signed over. Browning had got to Graham via his kids. But when Graham finally went to Gander to see how the picture was taking shape, he discovered that his business partners had left town months before. Eventually, the business's car was found at Melbourne Airport. Browning and Dame Clare had fled overseas. In the end, there was only one way out of the mess for an honourable man. There was no option of going bankrupt and losing the house and having no future for my children and a bankruptcy no hard to get it. I just had to become the funeral director. He had to learn the business in a matter of weeks. His first funeral was a nerve-wracking affair, but everything has gone smoothly. He's now done nine, but it does have its moment. But Graham Webb is looking forward. He's slowly paying back the debts, saving his children's future. I always believe that my destiny is to make it, and especially for my children. That's what I'm all about. Uh, I can't let my children down, can I? Love you. Have a good day. See you soon. See you guys. No, we can't. David Marvin reporting there with a man who certainly doesn't believe in shirking his responsibilities. Picking himself up in 1999, he co-founded Sunshine FM, a radio station targeting baby boomers, which went to air in the year 2000. He became the breakfast host and was very good at it. Presently, Graham hosts a radio program called Webby's Golden Years of Radio. It's an audio book of his life behind the microphone. It is now a weekly two-hour program syndicated to many community stations around the country. Graham says, along with the amazing music from the past six decades, I'm including personal interviews with stars such as the Beatles, the Monkees, ABBA, and many others, especially our own Aussie stars. I'm also including grabs from many radio shows of the past and my personal collection. Graham Webb, he's done it all. Television, radio, producer, director, and the voice to millions of people. Oh, it's certainly this year, wasn't it? Oh, don't cry. <laughs> How do you feel, like? right? Give a big round of applause, everybody. Yeah. 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 Well, it's certainly this year, wasn't it? Oh, it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> Graham wanted to know, was his life boring? It wasn't boring at all, was it? I think 
you'll find everybody that uh, he's what wasn't mentioned there that he gave a lot of Australians a start. He gave a lot of people uh, when people back in the 60s and 70s when you needed airplay, Graham was the first one to play Australian music. Yeah. Hey, Graham, you got me crying now. <laughs> We need some music right now, everybody. And I'd like to bring up uh, John. John Campbell is over here. Big round of applause for John. 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 Big round of